Great to see such a nice crowd. Thanks for coming. So yeah, I'll be talking about the world's fastest machine learning with GPUs. So that's pretty presumptuous, right? And I have to qualify that, of course. It's not completely true in every possible dimension, but we'll see. You can uh, check out the GitHub. This uh, is an open source project by HUAI. The open source project is in collaboration with NVIDIA. They have a few engineers, we have a few engineers, and we're putting our heads together in order to do some good work with GPUs. So first let me talk about what kind of problems I'm going to be referring to. So there are many different ways to solve problems, and recently a Kaggle survey, you're probably all familiar with Kaggle, figured out that among about 7,000 data scientists, that the top use case for the type of model is actually logistic regression. Anybody here imagine why that might be so? There's probably multiple reasons, but fast. Simple, there's a lot of problems where they basically want a, want a binary answer. Why do more complicated? This fact works well in lots of models. That's right, simple. Anybody else? Yes? It's interpretable. Interpretable, that's great, yeah. So these are all true, and so a lot of businesses want the most interpretable model when they have to be presented with an audit or explain to their customers why they were rejected for a certain credit card, etc. So logistic regression is excellent for that. Um, decision trees, random forests, these all, and gradient boosting machines, these are all kind of tree methods that are all common. And uh, of course we have neural networks up here. Now, I'm going to completely arbitrarily, and this is not going to become a debate, I'm going to say it's completely arbitrarily, say that this is machine learning. Anybody disagree with that? You kind of know what I mean? Classical machine learning, <laughs> pre kind of the, the boost from neural networks. And then the rest of this, let's call it deep learning. Just to classify it as, well, it's a neural network of some kind, it's probably deep, and it's usually used for language, natural language processing or images or something like that. Of course, it can be used for machine learning too. Now, is there any reason why I would do this? Like, why aren't we using neural networks for everything today? Do you guys have some ideas? Maybe it's, maybe we should, why aren't we? If the data has an analytic structure, you've got something better than, than, the, than the discreteness of neural networks, and you'd be silly to not take advantage. That's one example, yeah. Um, it's the cost of doing the processing. This is the cost of actually, like, it's expensive to run a neural network model, right, to train it. Uh, but suppose that you had infinite amount of time. Would it still be true that neural yeah, networks are the best? Amount of time, neural networks are expensive in terms of the data they require. If you've got an analytic structure, you can often get rather good estimates in vastly smaller sets of data. Yeah, that's also a good, good point. Anybody else have any other ideas? Yes, go ahead. Say it again. No, not enough data, right. In general, not enough data. Um, so that's right. So another reason why I've separated this is because generically, yes, the neural network uh, models are extremely difficult to train and very slow. Now, in principle, and there's been work in progress toward this, you could completely rewrite all of the classical machine learning algorithms in terms of neural networks. This is not a done deal yet, but you could in principle. Now, if you did that, then maybe you could get rid of this stuff. And for example, in TensorFlow recently, it was attempted to write a GBM or a gradient boosting machine, uh, machine in TensorFlow. Um, but there's, in the paper, there's no performance metrics. The reason why is it's extremely slow. So, there are reasons why we do this. We have classical machine learning algorithms because we can fine tune them because they're very specific. And it's, it's no different than if you really know how to play chess, you're gonna be really brilliant at it. It's not necessarily a transferable knowledge. It's not a general kind of skill. So these are kind of very specialized skills, but we can set up algorithms and codes to do them very, very fast. And so that's what we wanna do. We wanna use GPUs in particular to make those really, really fast. So what about the kinds of languages people use? These are the same 7,000 data scientists. What kind of languages do you use? 
Well, primarily Python, maybe some R, and uh, you know, Jupyter Notebooks, SQL, TensorFlow is down here. I think this partially as a separate language because, of course, Google bought Kaggle. And a bunch of other kind of stuff. And anybody can explain why Python is commonly used as opposed to maybe R or especially as opposed to C++. Let's say these are a broad slice of data scientists. Yeah. Libraries? Perhaps libraries, the, the basically extensibility of the, of the language. There's a lot of code that's written that's easily importable. Yeah. Anything else? R is a bit different in terms of how it works. It's different. Yeah. Anything different is a little bit scary. Yeah. It's not so different. Yeah. But why not everything in C++? Isn't that the best? Just kind of. I think that to inter reinterpret that, I think it's, a, you know, it's like TensorFlow, it's a pretty complicated language, and Python is pretty simple, and it's easy to prototype almost anything. It may not be necessarily be the fastest, it may not be the best thing to do in a production environment, but it's pretty good for a lot of data science problems. And particularly, I'll be focusing on these. This is what our project has focused on by implementing something which is Pythonic primarily. It's also going to have an R interface, or it has a, already an R interface that's being built up. And of course, we're going to be working with Jupyter Notebooks. So this is the primary interface. There is a C++ backed end which you can directly interface with, but primarily we're thinking about that, excuse me, high level interface. So one of the reasons why we want to use GPUs is because they're really fast, especially now. Now, why is that? What's the, what's the issue? You have probably have seen something like this before. You've probably seen that, in general, there's a prediction that people have been making, like John Hennessy at Stanford, that while the transistor count has been slowly increasing at a steady pace for a very long time, the actual single-threaded performance has kind of tapered off from about an increase every 18 months or so to much, much less than that. And while, in principle, you can make everything parallel, there are a lot of, especially machine learning problems, that aren't easy to parallelize. Or there's a lot of things, it's a lot slower if, even if you do. It's not going to be equal in, in boost as number of cores you have on your system. So how do you overcome this? It, I mean, obviously, the solution I'm referring to is to use GPUs. So what do GPUs do? So the point is that GPU computing has com continued to advance by, and it's gonna, it's gonna, there's no reason it should stop. It should be about a thousand times even faster by 2025 than the CPU. That's a huge difference. Now, why is this happening? Why, can anybody explain in the audience, why is this actually happening? Why are, we, why are GPUs so useful? Why don't we just go to all GPU? Why, why do we use CPUs at all? You have to have problems that fit the architecture, right? Yeah, can you be more specific? Yeah, so, so GPUs are composed of like uh, thousands and thousands, however many uh, very single purpose uh, processors. Like, mm -hmm. they, they, they focus on doing one task and you have like a, a million of them that do this one task. Yeah, that's basically right. I mean, the, this sort of idea is that CPUs are optimized for low latency, and they're very good at out-of-order branch prediction, so that you can have a highly complicated set of logic conditionals in your code, and given those conditionals, it will execute through and figure out which path to take extremely fast. On the other hand, GPUs are optimized for highly data parallel situations where you have basically the same problem over multiple data elements, highly parallelized. And it can have a quite... I guess we're getting some interference. <laughs> that sounds like my coworker, Nav Deep. I'm not sure where he is. Um, <laughs> he's, just, he's just trying to mess with me. I know it. Is anybody in control of the audio? <laughs> Besides me speaking into it? And your colleague. And my colleague? Yeah. Okay, I guess nobody's responding, so we'll see. Um, so, the idea is that the GPUs are 
very fast, but, and they may take a while to get going, but once they get going, they can churn really quickly. So if you have a, a problem with, that has to be come back very quickly, you're gonna be killed by latency with GPUs. This is especially true because for GPUs currently as they're architected, you have to go, you have to get the data to the GPU in the first place. And that comes from transferring over the bus, or at best, if you have an NVIDIA kind of CUDA architecture, then you've got to go over NVLink between the CPU and the, and the GPU, and that takes time. So you have transfer issues, you have latency issues once you're on the GPU to get going, and only then uh, does the computation start. And so if you have, if you have something that requires very quick feedback, it's not going to work with the GPU. Now, this, this is sort of in the context that it's still really fast, it's just not necessarily going to be as fast as the CPU. So you can still play video games. But if you're doing something like a really quick prediction in a real time at the edge online, and you're, you want only a single instance of prediction coming back to you, you feed it into the system coming back, it's a very small amount of data. It's going to have to go over the bus, over NVLink, start up on the GPU, and then complete, and then send it back to the CPU. And that can be a very long road. But if you're doing batch prediction, where you have a huge number of things you're trying to predict, uh, that can be extremely fast because you have a huge amount of data, you send it all over, you, you predict a bunch of things at once, and then you're good to go, and you can transfer that back. That can be much faster than the CPU. So, you know, given these limitations in mind, there are some things for which GPUs are not going to do very good at. Very small data, not going to be good for a CPU, uh, GPU, just not going to be have, not going to overcome that latency problem. But if you have big enough data and it still fits in the memory of the GPU, then you're good. Now, does everybody understand that? GPUs have a lot less memory than a typical system and system RAM. Excuse me, you left out yeah. a pivotal word. Don't say big, say parallel. That's really important. Can you give me context? Sorry, I'm not sure what you're referring to. If you have a million things to do and they're locked, and, you, and they calculate the answers independently of the, the GPUs that are shown. Yeah. If you have a million things that have to be done sequentially, yes. each one depending on the next, in fact, GPUs will stink, CPUs will be slow, but in fact, they'll be better yes. for that sequential problem. So yes. it's not really, it, so it's really the shape of the algorithm. Yeah, I mentioned that in the very beginning. Yeah, but it's also, the data size is a secondary thing. The primary thing I mentioned was the fact that you have to be doing the same operation over every element. Yes. Once you're there, yeah, the same operation, parallel, at the same time. Actually, if you look at the Livermore stuff, in fact, it's not necessarily the same operation, but it's the fact that it's parallel is you 90% of the Yeah, that's a good point. So I, let's say in the case of uh, NVIDIA GPUs, when I say the same task, it turns out that there's something called, uh, uh, I'm forgetting what it's called, it's basically whenever the different uh, cores on the GPU are doing different tasks. And as soon as you do that, it becomes all serial. So it actually has to be essentially the same task for every data element for, for example, the NVIDIA architecture to work. Otherwise, uh, it, it turns into a serial process. There are intermediate things like many core machines where you can have lots of cores doing somewhat different things in almost parallel. Mm -hmm. So there, there are intermediates between sure. the so, so I think that makes sense. It's a good discussion, makes sense. Let's see what else we can say. So one of the things that we are trying to do here is work with NVIDIA, work with MapD, a bunch of other people, Anaconda, in trying to avoid some of these latency issues. So we want to have everything on the GPU. So if you can initially have the data on the GPU using some means, by importing directly in the GPU, then the idea is that instead of going back and forth uh, processing the data to the CPU, back on the GPU, munge it on the CPU, back to the GPU, predict, figure out what your prediction should be and go back to the GPU to do the prediction. Have everything, the whole pipeline be on the GPU. That way you avoid some of this transfer and maybe you can hide some of the latency because you can do some of these things slightly in parallel. It's, it can do some, what we call concurrency for diff different operations. So you can sometimes hide the latency. So that's, that's a pretty good idea, and that's a work in progress. Um, you can uh, ask more about that if you have interest. So this project is, an, as I mentioned, an open source project, which is used within what we call driverless AI, a product. 
And it actually can boost performance up to about 30 times. I'll show a little quick demo of that in the very end of that particular product. It's a key thing is it's based upon the scikit-learn API or interface. Now, what do I mean by that? I mean that you can do something like create a model, do model.fit, model.predict, or model.transform, those kinds of operations. How many people here are familiar with the scikit-learn API? Okay, so you kind of know what I'm talking about. Now, the psychic guys, if you ask them, and I have, and they, you can go online and Google this, they don't want to, they don't want to do anything really to the GPUs. They think it's a horrible thing. It's going to create too much mess for their code. Uh, so they don't want to do it. So basically we said, well, we, we want it, we need it. So let's create it. We know that we need to do a lot of kind of munging and feature generation, et cetera which are going to use many of these scikit-learn APIs, uh, scikit-learn uh, model and uh, unsupervised, supervised. And so we need to be able to have this on the GPU to make our product really fast. And we said, well, let's contribute to the open source community and have all of the scikit <coughs> stuff uh, on the GPU. Now, we are in a stage where we're quite, quite early, so we have only a handful of algorithms on the GPU. But they're the most important ones to us. These are gradient boosting machines, GLMs, <laughs> including logistic regression, linear regression, and uh, k-means, and truncated SVD, things like that. So these are all important, some of the more important algorithms that you would find in uh, the scikit-learn package or uh, repo repository. And so we're doing this kind of one step at a time. We would love for the community to help contribute. And we have, like I mentioned, some NVIDIA engineers working on various things. And in general, this is our kind of picture, our roadmap of how things look right now. Now this is by no means a strict requirement, but we're hoping to pace ourselves and, and have this roadmap uh, work out. So as I mentioned, we have several algorithms that are already in place. Uh, and this is all within that scikit-learn API style. And in fact, one of the nice things about it is that we don't just have a few algorithms and then you're done. Like we, we basically are broke if you try to run it with a different algorithm that we don't have. If you don't have it for the GPU, will back up and use the CPU version that's available with Scikit. So the whole package is completely equivalent to Scikit. If it works on the GPU, we, we document that, and it will run on the GPU. And if it doesn't have a GPU capability for that particular algorithm, we'll just use the CPU version. And it's all automatic in the background. And you, we give you more control if needed, but otherwise it's more or less plug and play. You can literally do import H204 GPU as sklearn and it should just be a drop-in replacement for sklearn. So that's what we're trying to achieve. Right, so the key thing, and that's really regarding the API support, what we're working on now is these kind of things, as I mentioned, uh, SVD, and this particular the truncated version of that. Anybody have any ideas why you might need something like k-means clustering? Is that something that you guys are familiar with? Recommendation. Say it again? Recommendation. Perhaps, yeah. Uh, there's many kind of different levels you could say that why you need to do clustering. Anywhere from a particular recommendation system or you, know, you, you need to cluster your data somehow, aggregate the data. You don't want to memorize the data, you want to somehow uh, com compress it. Yeah, all good. Yes? I have a question actually about the game of clustering. Um, is the version that you've implemented on GPUs, is that the mini-batch version of uh, k cluster? It's an excellent question. Uh, so currently it is not the mini-batch version, okay. uh, but that, that is our plan yeah. next. It, I mean, you know, the, the mini-batch k would seem to be a natural fit to GPUs. Right? Well, then you have to do streaming. So that's a very good question. So then you have to consider whether or not you stream the data into the GPU. And in that case, it's not going to be, it's only going to be about a factor of two faster than if you simply chunk it and upload, cluster, cluster on that, try up another cluster on another chunk of data, etc. But that factor of two will be important eventually. Uh, but we don't even do chunking right now. Right now it just has to fit on the GPU. And so the, all these things are in our, our plans. We have essentially an engineer dedicated to k-means and an engineer dedicated to uh, GBM uh, and an engineer dedicated to SVD at this moment. And once those are in place and, and have all these features, uh, we'll move on. We have NVIDIA engineers dedicated to column filters, uh, k-nearest neighbors, uh, and uh, things like a DB scan. Uh, 
PCA, of course, is very similar to SVD, so we will we'll be easy to implement that. Right, and of course, uh, in the future, we'll be adding more support for that project I mentioned before, which is this Go AI project, basically being able to not just have a scikit-learn API, like fit, predict, transform, but literally it would be, you, you, can't, you don't just have to feed in a pandas or numpy array, but you can feed in a GPU kind of pointer, a memory location for the, the GPU. And so you never have to leave the GPU in that case. So that means, and that will help if you, if you can uh, concatenate a bunch of those operations and you're just sitting on the GPU, you could do that yourself, or you could use this Go AI stuff. You can either use H204 GPU for that, or you can use this. Um, either way, you can still stay, stay on the GPU. And um, of course, we have uh, many of our algorithms are single GPU or multi GPU, or s even will run on a multiple GPUs with a single model. So, for example, for GBMs, it's a multi GPU for single model. So, it actually distributes the data across the, the, the GPUs and continuously reduces that information in order to build a better and better model. We have other algorithms which are not at that stage yet. For example, GLM. It actually does a multi-GPU by doing a sort of uh, embarrassingly parallel approach by building multiple models and having each model on each GPU. But I'll, I'll explain that soon. So we have different kind of uh, ideas. And of course, we want to do multi-machine eventually. So we have a distributed algorithm like the original H2O is. And we have many plans for the future, uh, which are, you know, this is a, a longer time scale, so we don't know exactly how this will play out, but uh, this is our, our goal. And the idea eventually is to completely replace H2O as a product. This will be, currently it's version H2O3, this will be H2O4. And it will include both the CPU and GPU as, uh, algorithms for all that, yeah. Well, that's a great question. So that's one of the things that uh, the NVIDIA engineer is working on. Um, so I, I, don't, I can't answer that question uh, particularly. But there are some algorithms, even, even the SVD, if, if the data size gets small enough, it is actually difficult to do everything in parallel. Uh, so there, is, there are some algorithms which are easier to parallelize than others. So we can talk about it afterwards, though. And of course, we, uh, apart from all these, we're, we're looking at many different domains. We're, we're you know, domain agnostic in some sense, but we, we do reach out to communities to make sure that we uh, look at you know, particular types of domains to make sure we're not leaving out any interesting aspects of our algorithms. And eventually, as I mentioned, uh, we're trying to merge these uh, in this quarter so that we can eventually replace the H203 product with this H204. But that's probably a longer time scale. These are all the different kind of aspects of a product going into one. Okay, so let's get into the models, the algorithm. So the first kind of model I'll refer to is the generalized linear model, which is an H204 GPU. And this is using an algorithm that Steve Boyd at Stanford created. So I'm trying to increase the volume here. And it's not doing anything. It's OK. Uh, no, it's the volume for the laptop. I guess it's, it's maybe hooked up to some kind of volume. Uh, we'll see if it works. So this is an algorithm by Steve Boyd at Stanford and, and his students. It's, uh, it's just a standard ADMM approach, but it, it uses some kind of proximal graph technique to split everything. And that makes it completely general. You can do a linear SVM with the POGS approach. You can do logistic regression, linear regression, uh, non-negative least squares. You can do all sorts of constrained problems. Uh, currently, we are only implementing the logistic regression, linear regression. But uh, we plan to implement other of their possible algorithms with this. So it's a very generalized thing, but it's all linear. So it's a, you know, this, this is really appropriate in this case that it's generalized. And we have several of these algorithms. Uh, of course, all the reduced versions of these algorithms are true, too, like Ridge or uh, uh, Lasso. These are the two extremes of the generalized elastic net uh, regression. And uh, we do what's called a full alpha search, meaning that the alpha parameter uh, that goes from between zero, 0 and 1, we, vary that, we can vary that arbitrarily and build models in parallel for multiple alpha on, on different GPUs. 
We do cross-validation, so that means that we actually check, say, if we have the full data, we break it up into any number of folds, and we check the score within each fold, and then the model is built out of some kind of average model across all folds. So this is a standard cross-validation approach. It's also done in H203. There's early stopping, so it's kind of smart about how it not only for each model stops, but how for the entire alpha and lambda space it will stop as well. And there, of course, uh, it's scikit-learn API style now, and it supports multiple GPUs in the sense that it has this capability to uh, run multiple models at the same time. So let me show you. I, don't, I guess there's not going to be any sound. Okay, it's coming out of this thing. Not sure if I can turn up the volume here. Ah, it's at maximum volume. So basically, this is showing on the left a GPU case, and on the right a CPU case. What you're seeing is the alpha parameter and the lambda parameter, which controls the overall regularization of the model. Alpha controls whether it's a L1 kind of model or an L2 kind of model. And what you're seeing here in color is the accuracy, the relative accuracy from zero to one. Red being a bad model and green being a good model. And the black circle is the current best model. And what you're seeing is the GPU on a DGX1, which maybe not all of us can afford individually, uh, has eight GPUs running at max. And it's being able to generate so far 2,400 models. And here's the sa same kind of CPU with 40 cores and it's not even started yet. It's still just kind of getting ready to go. Otherwise, these algorithms are identical. So this is the only difference here is that you're on a GPU. The algorithm is exactly the same. In the back end, if you're familiar, it uses, both algorithms use matrix blast calls. So these are the standard kind of blast calls that you would do. Okay, now the CPU has gotten going, but we're almost done with the GPU. And by the way, this is on the data set, which is the U.S. Census data set, which has about, after encoding, about 10,000 columns and about 45,000 rows. It's a small portion of the data set. And this is also doing five-fold cross-validation. And now after the validation, it's figured out that this is the best model. Of course, you know, we're smart enough by our eye to have figured out maybe this is a pretty good spot to have landed. And you can, of course, tune your algorithms for that. And this is just going to keep on going. Never going to stop, <laughs> basically. So I can show that kind of in a bar chart style. So this is two Xeon CPUs taking about 3,600 seconds in order to complete that kind of US Census data set model or a set of models. I really kind of consider it, say, one model because in any case, if you're doing elastic net regression, you're going to want to know what alpha and lambda would work best. And so you're going to have to explore that parameter space anyways. It's not too different from hyperparameter space exploration. So you're going to have to look at multiple models if you want the best one. And this, so this is a reasonable thing to do. But a single GPU will be much faster, about 700 seconds, two, four, and eight. And so you can see, not only is it much faster on the GPU, even a single GPU, but it also scales pretty well with number of GPUs. One of the reasons for that is because, of course, we're doing an embarrassingly parallel operation where we're throwing multiple models at the GPU as in a sequential way, uh, for, and each GPU has its own model independently of others. So it's actually able to do this pretty efficiently for multiple GPUs. Any questions about all that? Okay. All right, so let's look at another algorithm. Let's look at gradient boosting machines. How many people have here have used GBMs or Random Forest or something like that? So most of you, okay, good. So as you know, a tree or decision tree is very simple. You could say, okay, does the guy have a job? Yeah, he probably has this as his income. Does he have a job but he owns a house? No, he doesn't have a job but he owns a house. Yeah, okay, he's not gonna be that wealthy. Does he doesn't have a job, he doesn't own a house. Okay, he's gonna be pretty poor. This would be like how much income is predicted for a given individual, say, from the census. And of course, you could have disjoint trees where you first create this tree, and then you update this tree with another subtree to improve the accuracy. 
And this would have be how you build trees upon trees in order to improve the accuracy of the model. And this is how a classic program like XGBoost works or like LightGBM works. The details of those depends upon exactly how you build the tree, but the process of building up sequential trees is usually the same. And of course, with random forests, you're building these independently and, and somehow stacking them together, blend, blending them together. Now, our H2O4 GPU uh, code just uses XGBoost. Now, why do we do that? Well, we have, as part of our, one of our employees or contractors, the top developer of XGBoost currently. And he happens to be the creator of the GPU version of XGBoost. And he's constantly making improvements, so we're working with him to constantly improve the product including this open source product. So some of the interesting things that he's done over his tenure is try to make this thing as fast as possible and as accurate as possible. One of the things that you can do is you can take the raw float data that you're given from some kind of data set and essentially bin it and bin it in a way so that each quantity is distributed so that you have it as more like quantile bins so that you don't put everything into one bin. So it's distributed well. And you can also store that information, that quantile information is, uh, is compressed information. Now, why would you want to do that? Anybody have any idea? Well, I kind of say it right here. Uh, if you can have all this compressed bin information, you have a lot less information to send to the GPU. So that overcomes that transfer latency I talked about in the beginning. So that's pretty good. Now, the other thing it can, you might think that GPUs are really bad at logic, right? About at conditionals. And you might think sparsity sounds like a conditional issue. Let's imagine your data set has a huge amount of data, but only very little data is actually not, is actually there. Most of it's missing or something like that. Or most of it's zeros or ones or something. You might think that GPUs are bad at this, but actually it turns out GPUs can actually do really well. So sparsity specifically is not a problem. You can code up a kernel to deal with the sparsity and the pointers telling you exactly where to go without any problem. So the other thing that we did was we created the multi-GPU version of XGBoost after all this was done. And that's essentially like I told you, it's, it's just sharding the rows of data onto different GPUs, figuring out how to bend them. And then once you have the histogram information, collecting the histogram across the GPUs. So this is, this is referred to as the histogram approach in XGBoost. Now what we've done lately, which I don't have on this slide because we're moving very quickly, is there is a program out there called uh, LightGBM by Microsoft you may be familiar with. It's very good. Uh, it has a different technique. Whenever it builds trees, instead of building an entire tree depth-wise and breadth-wise simultaneously, so that you have a full breadth tree, they first check whether they should build a tree down or split by losing a lot the, the specific loss function that you've provided. And they figure out, well, if I shouldn't split, let's not split, let's keep going until you have to split, until you know you need to split the tree. And this loss, so-called loss guided approach, because you're guided by the loss function, is builds trees which can become sparse in some sense. So the tree would, instead of looking like a dense kind of uh, triangle with every node filled, it will have lots of gaps because it decided not to split as often. And you can control this. Now, anybody can tell me why one would want to have a sparse tree on GPUs? Less memory. There's less memory, exactly. Anything else? It's related. Fewer things to process, yeah. That's why it's going to be faster. And in particular, how about that uh, issue of communication between GPUs? It's going to be less, right? So you'll also be able to parallelize things much more efficiently because there's less, much less to transfer between GPUs to communicate that histogram information. So that's a good reason to do a different technique like the loss guide. This is a general principle, of course. It's okay to be fast, it's much better usually to be smart. And so developing a smart algorithm is often better. And you shouldn't use GPUs as an excuse to do only brute force approaches. 
So this is just a, a general principle, of course, you probably all agree, but it's a good lesson here, uh, especially because it can solve multiple problems when you use a different smart approach when you're dealing with GPUs. Okay. Now, I don't have a, a cute movie or anything for the gradient boosting machines, but I do have a bar chart. And this is the same kind of thing where, in this case, it's the so-called Higgs data set. Anybody heard of that before? It's a so-called uh, God particle. They won the Nobel Prize for it last year for, uh, for its discovery in the Large Hadron Collider. Of course, the guys who did the experiment didn't get the, didn't get the Nobel Prize. It was the theorists who figured it out. Um, so this is 1 million rows and 29 columns. And this is the time on a CPUs. And GPUs were originally like, you know, we're, we're making lots of good progress, and this is how I, want to, how I want to show this. We used to have these times on each 1, 2, 4, and 8 GPUs, 400 seconds, 300, etc. And you can see it's scaling pretty well. Now this is, again, uh, having each GPU solve a different problem. So it's like scanning over what, what's called max depth. Anybody know what max depth means as far as gradient boosting machines? I see some, some nods. But basically, it's how far can you go, how deep can you go in the tree. And if it was a full tree, without loss guide approach, the original sort of uh, standard actually boost approach, it would fill up with two to the depth, max depth nodes. Now, this is uh, how fast it is in that case. We recently, like say about maybe three weeks ago or something like that, did some various improvements and we were able to increase this uh, decrease the speed time by a factor of two. And this is not, I'm not even showing the loss guide approach here because it's kind of apples and oranges comparison in the sense that the model you get is different. So that's, that's often the trade off when you go to a smart algorithm is that, well, it's not the same model anymore. So it's a little bit difficult to compare. But if we compare at least our, the XGBoost and the Microsoft Light GBM loss guide approaches, they're comparable in speed. So we're not worse than Microsoft, let's say. Okay, so in this, these speed ups are constantly happening and we're constantly improving things. This is an example of how things can be fast on the GPU. So this is the so-called test error. This is when you, know, you train on some kind of data set, you get your tree, and now uh, we wanna figure out during that training, if we have some test set, what is happening on the actual test set during that training? And this is the time in seconds during the training, and this is the test error during training. And this is just showing that versus time, if you have 32 cores with two Xeons, that you're going to train much slower than if you do on the GPU. So it's about a factor of five in this case. You're gonna, for the same test error, you can reach that within a factor of five times less time. And then, now think about this, like, I think this is an important point, this is one of the things that people have been pushing for GPUs like Andrew Ng and others, is that would you rather wait a, a whole day before you figure out whether your results are good or an hour? And obviously there's a huge amount of extra iteration you can do, improvement you can do if you can do this multiple times in a day rather than for waiting a whole day. So this is the kind of thing that you can do with GPUs. Any questions about GBMs or in general all this stuff? How about the accuracy? Which one is more accurate in comparing to the uh, Microsoft? Like, They're the same. It, the accuracy is exactly the same. Yeah, if you, if you put in exactly the same parameters, it will give you the same model. In terms of the, the previous version of the GBM that you have already provided? So uh, there's the... Yeah, so if you, oh, it's a good, if you compare the different approaches, mm -hmm. like the smart versus the brute force kind of model, the model where you build the entire tree mm -hmm. versus the model where you use the loss to guide you about the tree, often the loss guided approach can be much deeper mm -hmm. with the same number of nodes. Yeah. And so you're actually able to get a much more accurate model in general. But you always have to worry about overfitting. Yes, I was going to ask that how's the generalization, but because yeah. um, the recommendation is that your depth should not be beyond, uh, you know, eight or ten, something like this. Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, in, in the case of light GBM, you can easily get 25, 40, 50 depth, sometimes 200 depth. Yeah, that's and the overfitting. Yeah. Well, you know, you test that. You can test it by cross-validating, and uh, you have to also make sure that you do that carefully. There's a, 
uh, various blog posts about this exact thing. If you Google, uh, I think it's a Zillard uh, wrote a blog post about yeah. this. So it's some good, some good ideas. Yeah, so you always have to be careful when you think about the accuracy of these models and you, know, you have to not just look at the test error, but do cross-validation and make sure you're doing the correct kind of cross-validation. What's the cost comparison between the dual Xenon and the GPU? Yeah, that's a great question. So in this case, I believe that these are currently about, it's, it's much more expensive for the item itself. So if you have this, I think it's, maybe it's about $400, $300, something like that currently. Uh, it depends upon whether you get the Tesla version uh, or the generic GTX GeForce version. Yeah, um, and you know this can be like also a couple hundred bucks, something like that. Um, but if you already have a system, you know you've already bought this. You, you're probably using it if you're, you have a data scientist and you're sitting at your desktop. You probably already have this, and so have, getting this is a small increment on top of the desktop overall. I think that's one way to view it. Now, if you're in an enterprise situation, should you buy a DGX1? That's a much different question. Uh, if, you, if you're literally looking for using the latest software that is able to run really fast on that single node of a DGX, then it can really be a boost. If you already have a giant farm of computers and, all your, and you don't really need, uh, uh, G, then you probably don't really need GPUs if you're using older software that doesn't take advantage of the, the kind of single node speed. Yeah, it's a good question though. It's, it's not, if you look at Amazon instances and you ask, okay, should I buy the GPU instance or not? It, it's, it's all over the place exactly. There's no exact answer, but it's a good question still. So along the price uh, question, right? You had a slide earlier where you said you got a 30 times speed improvement. It depends, but yes. Have you done any analysis, not on the small thing, but I'm talking serious. Do I have to pay 30 times as much to get that 30 times performance improvement? It depends. So I think with the current, like take an example with the recent P3 instances, which are Volta. Uh, it's like $3, $3 an hour for one of those things for two GPUs. And you can imagine that you're going to get uh, you know, something like this performance. And otherwise, you're going to buy an instance which is not a GPU for about a $1, one, doll, one hour, sorry, $1 per hour and you're gonna get this kind of performance. So this is about a factor of 10 for about a factor of three. So in this particular case, it works out, but it doesn't always necessarily work out. That's all I'm saying. It depends on the algorithm. And that's, that's one of the reasons I mentioned at the very beginning that not all, all algorithms are GPU friendly. It's just a generic issue. Some are easy to paralyze, some are not. Some people discover ways to paralyze things and then you could then it would benefit on the GPU more. For example, uh, co coordinate descent, so-called technique for GLMs. Uh, people discovered maybe 10 years, you could do a parallel coordinate descent. And as soon as you have that, you can do it on multiple cores. But of course, it also means you can do it on multiple GPUs or multiple cores within a GPU. Yeah. Okay. So one of the last algorithms I'll mention is k-means. And this is actually based upon a partnership with NVIDIA. They had a prototype and we fixed it up essentially. Now in this case, the only other alternative out there was basically Scikit. And it turns, of, turns out in terms of Scikit comparison, it can be about 50 times faster. So that can be a significant improvement, much more than you would usually have for other algorithms where people were working on the CPU side quite a bit. Um, it's also significantly faster than other GPU implementations by about five to 10 times, so that's good. And it supports multiple GPUs for each single model, which is good. So what do I mean by k-means, in case you don't know? Uh, so, and you, for all of this, there are examples. Every, every demo I show, if you go to the GitHub repository, you go to examples, pi, and then demos, and you'll see all these demos. So in this case, we're just having some fun. We take a grid of data, which has a logo. I think it's an important logo. Uh, we just kind of sample from that some noise, some random sampling, and then we say, okay, let's look at these points. How are they clustered? And this is showing off exactly how they're clustered by choosing an arbitrary number of clusters, say 21 or something like that. So 
Uh, any questions about that I should ask? Any questions about the clustering? Exactly how it's done? And so I, I should show the actual the code. Oh, that's not coming up. Close that, go over here. So this is the example of what I meant by the repository. So it's h 4 gp repository examples by demos. And then you can look at a certain notebook. And it's not that complicated. So just to show you an example, uh, you just import a few packages. You choose your clusters, let's say 21. You grab an image from somewhere. It can be any image, doesn't matter. In this case, it's 3,000 by 3,000 in size. And we're just showing it's a small portion. Uh, we create a bunch of uh, random data. And then we sample the original logo at those locations ran that were randomly chosen. So all this is pre-processing. It has nothing to do with our stuff. They show for GPU stuff. And then we uh, kind of initialize things, figure out how, how many rows do we have. So all this is not, nothing related to h 4 GPU. Here's where we start. So basically we import h 4 GPU. Let me make this a little bit bigger. We say, just like in scikit, model equals h 4 GPU dot k means number clusters equals k and you choose your tolerance. And you, do, you can do time, like this is just a notebook way of getting the, the total time it took. And you do model.fit on the data sets and any kind of labels, which we input no labels, so it automatically figures out the labels. Uh, and we do model.predict to figure out, well, what cl uh, clusters were each point associated with. That's the prediction here. And uh, then we figure out what the, we grab out what those cluster centers were. And all of that takes something like 15 seconds. And then that's basically done. 15 seconds later, you have the result. Again, the rest of this is nothing related to our stuff. It's just ways of seeing the results. And so we uh, then just plot basically this fun thing. It's just some cute way to plot it. Just, oops, just a plotting technique. And what you're seeing here is each one of these is an individual cluster, the black dot. And it's found the boundaries that encompass those point, points, which are identified with that cluster, that through the prediction. And you're just seeing those clusters. So, and you can run this on a huge amount of data, you know, for GPU, something like uh, seven gigabytes, or if you have a more modern GPU, 16 gigabytes. And it runs pretty fast. And so the question is, how much faster? So this is where there's a huge boost. And this is what we're starting to see with a lot of the scikit algorithms. They're not fast at all. They're really dumb and slow. And so while it's an excellent package and it's extremely easy to use, extremely impressive the way in which they laid out the entire architecture of the of the entire uh, package. It's actually really slow. So here's scikit-learn on a single CPU. It takes 1,200 seconds on a, that kind of uh, particular Kaggle data set, the home site data set, which happens to have 300 columns and about 300,000 rows. And this is use, looking for 1,000 centroids. And you can ask, why might you do that? We can talk about that. And this is again showing on a single Tesla P100, uh, in this case, versus a single CPU. And you can see it's a huge difference. And we have multiple GPU version, as I mentioned, which shows that it gets better pretty well up to four GPUs. We're still working on what's happening at high GPU count. Uh, this is the home site data set, which is from Kaggle, three, 300,000 rows and 300 columns. And we're trying to find a thousand clusters. And each point is a vector or it's number? Uh, well, it's uh, the number of features, let's say, is 300. And so, yeah, 300. So 300 dimensional. Now, since you brought it up, the question is, why would you ever 
do clustering on something which was 300 dimensions. Any, any problem with that, do you think? Does that sound okay? You comfortable with that? Got any hardcore data scientists here? I'm just pushing you. <laughs> well, there's an awful lot of room to see up yeah, this must be something wrong with that, right? Looking for clustering in very high dimensions. You can imagine complicated thin sheets of surfaces which you're clustering on. They may have nothing to do with the actual association of points. In general, it's not a good idea. This is more like a benchmark. Um, we're improving this algorithm all the time in order to handle smaller number of clusters, etc. I just don't have the, the bar charts for that. But essentially, uh, you might think, why do I want to do clustering at all? Well, if you do have a few dimensions, it can give you good information. So, and oftentimes, if you're doing feature generation, you might use a small number of features and try to cluster those features. And that's what one of the things we do at, at H2O. Anyways, this is a huge improvement. And here's TensorFlow. TensorFlow does not have in it k-means, but we tried our best. We got our, our several data scientists involved to try to write a k-means for TensorFlow. And we, we were not able to get it to be any better than this. Now, maybe that's not fair, but I guess, you know, we tried. If you don't believe it, try. Um, so, and this is basically showing that something like TensorFlow is not really good at doing classical machine learning. It's maybe as good as Scikit, but it's not going to be something where you're able to get a massive improvement automatically. And I should note that this is using a single core in, in the scikit-learn. It's not parallelized. The only thing that scikit can parallelize for k-means is an initialization of random seed. But this is using all the cores in the CPU, which has something like, a, in this case, six cores. So this is actually pretty bad that it's not able to, it's basically per core seven times worse than scikit. But with the GPU, we're able to do extremely, do that extremely quickly, yes? It's a great question. No, we don't, because it is difficult. As any of you know who has written TensorFlow code, it's not necessarily the easiest to use unless you're doing classical neural networks. It's not a fair comparison. It's not an absolutely fair comparison. This is a more fair comparison. And just knowing that this was seven cores and this was one core, it means it's not very impressive as an architecture. Um, on GPUs, if you, maybe you could do something different within TensorFlow, but generically, if you're writing a graph, it's just a, more or less a switch between CPU and GPU, and you, you can't really do, you, you don't expect it to be magic on the GPU. That's a good question. Uh, the last algorithm I'll mention, let's see what, how I'm doing on time, okay, is truncated SVD. Now, how many of you have used truncated SVD or SVD in general, or PCA perhaps? Okay, quite a few of you. So, as you know, with SVD, you're basically trying to take a matrix and decompose it into three terms, uh, where the kind of gray boxes or black boxes are the actual values, and this would be a, a diagonal matrix, and the rest of this would be some kind of other matrices. And the sort of general principle... <laughs> you're getting out of here, huh? <laughs> and the general principle is that this is very good for dimensionality reduction because you're basically taking, especially if you use a truncated version, you can choose how many vectors are going to represent the final data matrix. Now, what do I mean by that? Um, so you might do something like have the singular values here and the concepts and documents here from the original terms and documents in some, in some kind of document. So the basic idea is that you may have some kind of data which is actually not very dense semantically. And you may be able to reduce it into smaller things where you really don't really need that many either documents or that many concepts to describe the entire set of documents, for example. And don't, don't worry about the math down here. I'm not going to talk about it. Um, again, as I mentioned, you can do dimensionality reduction. So this is where you use the truncated version of SVD to, say, take the original set of features, which may be large, something like 10, not too large, let's say 10. And if you had to always carry around those features, it may, they may not be very useful. So you can do truncated SVD, find out which way in which you could sum up 
smaller sets of features, say three, to basically reproduce the matrix. That's what it's doing. And this is related to PCA, of course, you probably are familiar with this, that if you have a set of data, you can have some kind of first principle component, which represents the primary vector in truncated SVD, essentially. And you can have a second principle component that is representing the rest of the data. So the first component will explain most of the dispersion. So how well does it do on the H204 GPU? So basically this is time, and this is the kind of different scenarios, different matrices, one million by a thousand columns or features, reducing down to 10 features, maybe uh, reducing down to 100 features, reducing down to five, or reducing down to two. Now, for big data, the GPU compared to SKLearn is up here, and our GPU algorithm is down here. So we're doing much better than the CPU, which was what you would expect. That's what you've seen so far. In some cases, I didn't really, this is not very shown very well. In some cases, we actually don't do as well as SQLearn. The CPU, when there is very small data or there's very few features you're trying to extract. But this is an old slide. In the past couple of weeks, we've been able to improve this. So even in this small case, we're much faster by at least a factor of five compared to scikit-learn. So there's all these kind of improvements that are constantly happening. And overall, after we use all this stuff, we imagine that somehow we want to incorporate all these kinds of models to generate features, like reduce features down to interesting features, find clusters to generate features, etc., and build this into what we call the uh, driverless AI. So I'll just show a, a quick demo of that and we'll basically be done. So this is what it's going to look like. This is the driverless AI product on GPUs. This, this is basically like a cockpit from the future for data scientists. And it's showing that you've read in some data set. You'll see how this works in a second. It tells you how many rows and columns you have, if some were dropped. Uh, it tells you the target. And this is a credit card data set. So this is figuring out the target of who's going to default on the next month payment. And it's showing you, say, for the accuracy, how is that changing over epoch? And it's going to show you also the variable importance. And these variables are not just the raw variables, but features that have been generated by the algorithm using things like k-means, truncated SVD, these unsupervised techniques. And these scores are all generated by the GBM. So the scoring is always done by the tree. So we're using this combination of generating features through unsupervised techniques, then using a supervised technique to score those features to figure out which features are best. And over here, you just kind of see some dials that you can change and some other stuff here. So I'll show you that now. So this is going to show off the speed of a GPU in a real product setting, comparing the CPU and GPU. But first we're just going to show you, this is a housing market type data set with a million rows and 30 columns. We're going to choose whether they're going to be a first time home buyer. We're going to play around with the accuracy. Time is sort of how long are you willing to wait? How many epochs? And then there's interpretability, which chooses the strategy of the technique. So on the left here, we have an eight GPU Volta DGX system. And on the right is the same system, but it's with its eight hyperthreading cores. And what you're seeing here, it's hard to see on the top, but I can read it for you. So far, it's on the GPUs, it's scored about 40 models and generated 300 features. This is something a, a real data scientist sitting it would not be able to do as quickly. It's difficult to you know, figure out all these different ways of generating features and then scoring them, figuring out what's your best. This is all doing all that feature engineering for you. Now, this has already generated about 500 features and it's getting a good score and it's showing you the GPU usage over here. Every once in a while it blanks out because it's doing the, uh, what we call munging or the feature generation. We're not yet using H204 GPU for that part of the, we're gonna be incorporating that very soon before H204 World. And then you would see this completely stacked with GPU usage. Over here, we keep on going, burning all these 80 cores, and we haven't even started building only 12 models and maybe 
80 features or something like that. Over here, we're actually already done. We've completely gone and we've taken 25 times faster on the GPU. So this is a DGX, of course, which again is expensive, but it shows you what's possible. And you can, of course, sign up for this driverless AI if you go to our website. And you can download it, try it on your own system. Hopefully you have a GPU and you'll see good, good performance. One day later, the CPUs are still running. So this is really showing how, this is where you can iterate as a data scientist within 30 minutes to an hour, multiple times throughout the day, generating thousands of new, thousands of new features. Where on a CPU, you would just have to wait day by day and somebody else is gonna beat you. And the key thing is that, does it actually work? It does. So driverless AI d competes with other Kagglers, either in stealth mode or directly. And so very trivially, with zero labor, you just, we just downloaded a data set, and within a short time, within about, say, 10 minutes, we're able to rank number eight out of 100 of Kagglers. So this is really being able to do, not maybe the top grandmaster number one, but it's able to get you pretty close to that. If you, if you know Kaggle, it's basically the who wins is extremely subtle. It's a very small error. So if you want basically the best solution, this, is, this can do that. Okay, any questions? Thank you. All right, what's preventing GPUs from getting more memory? It's expensive. So it's much easier to buy memory that's slow for a CPU system than on a GPU which has much higher bandwidth, about 10 times the bandwidth. And so it will eventually grow, but if you're using massive data sets, the CPU, like terabytes of data, the CPUs are often still the way to go. If you're doing feature generation or something that's more of a data science role and not a production role, then actually the uh, GPUs are pretty good. How do CPUs and GPUs compare for the amount of instruction memory? Um, if it means by that, how much code can you put on the GPU? I don't know of a limit. I don't know of a limit on the GPU if there's a particular amount of memory that's limiting it for instructions. But uh, I, I, usually the kind of codes I'm, I'm writing are not gigabytes of code, maybe kilobytes. So I'll defer that to some expert. Um, let's see, do you plan on supporting OpenCL and non-NVIDIA GPUs? Yes, in general, the, the main roadmap is to support TPUs, et cetera, all these kinds of backends, and not necessarily just the CUDA. Uh, and that is allowed by our, our API being Pythonic, the code being C++, and most of the calls that we use are just BLAST calls, which can be implemented trivially on any kind of real architecture. So this would require the hardware manufacturer to at least minimally create an a API or library, which has, just like CUDA, blast calls and other really basic functions. Otherwise, we're good to go. Will you be adding GLRM, general low rank model, to SQLR from H2O? Uh, that's a great question. Uh, so these are the kind of things we're looking for. Uh, people to say, well, why aren't you doing this? And we say, oh, yes, customers, people want that. Uh, so that's, that's a great point, so I'll keep that in mind. Would HO4 GPU have a Python API for distance calculations, C dist or P dist? I'm not so sure about that. Uh, we'll, have to, we'll have to think about that. So there obviously is a priority of things and we'll take these suggestions as we can. HO3 uses HO frames, SQLearn uses sometimes sparse matrices or other Python da type data structures. What is H2O for GPU going to use for its data frames? This is a great question. At the moment, we're just using Pandas or NumPy input just like scikit-learn. Um, we also have this GPU kind of data frame that's sort of inherited from Num Numba, from Continuum, or if, uh, as a generic pointer on the GPU. But uh, this is something we're gonna have to think about if we're gonna wrap all this up, this kind of different things into one thing. So it's a great question. We don't, we, we're gonna stick with scikit-learn for now and, and deal with its way of doing things because we wanna keep with the API as much as possible and keep that drop-in replacement capability as much as possible. HO trees support category variables. Will you add that support? So that's a great question. So currently everything we do is either numeric or missing, and we handle that. It's uh, like XGBoost itself. But we don't currently handle categoricals, and we're, we're assuming that 
you probably want some kind of smart data scientist or driverless AI to take a raw data set of categoricals and encode them in interesting ways. There is not a unique answer. If you start with numerical data, it's all more or less unique about how you handle it. With categorical, there's, of course, many possibilities. It's not absolutely true. You can, of course, process and transform numerical, but generically, uh, there's many more possibilities with uh, categorical data. Let's see. Does H204GPU follow all parameters of sklearn's model API? Can it be used seamlessly on a code which is previously run on a CPU with few import changes? That's the hope, and we're trying to reach that point. So uh, it doesn't have all the capability of every algorithm, so it doesn't have all the parameters. And in cases where we believe that there is a parameter that you passed that would be an important issue, or important part of the algorithm, that you wanted a result that depended upon that, we revert to the CPU mode, unless you override it. So we try to have some smarts about which backend to use, but you can always override and use either CPU or GPU. What if all Kagglers start using driverless AI? What will separate them? Um, so I think that our ultimate goal with driverless is to have some programmability in it. And so you will be able to, as a data scientist, insert your own score function, your own kinds of feature generation techniques, and so that, that will separate the different data scientists in our vision. Okay, thanks guys. Any questions from the audience or? Essentially, yeah. Essentially, we have inside our product Scikit-Learn itself, and we use it as a backup when necessary. So we have kind of a top layer, which is like a wrapper, which then chooses which backend to use based upon the parameters. And if it uses our backend, then it goes to the, either our GPU technique or our CPU technique. Otherwise, it goes to the Scikit technique. And the package is on the GitHub address? Or? Yeah, there's a wheel, there's wheel file and the soon be a Docker file if you're that kind of person. And you can, you can compile all the code yourself as well. Okay. okay. Yes? So where is HO3 going versus HO4? Are you going to keep on working on HO3? Or are you going yeah, it's going to be continuously developed. Um, with HO3, I think it's until HO4 completely reproduces everything that HO3 has, it's still going to be around, which is not going to be, you know, we're not going to be completely reproducing HO3 very soon. And there's a slightly different goal. It's those things which are optimal on the GPU first and are useful first, as opposed to with H203, it would be more of anything goes for the CPU. So it's a slightly different target architecture which changes things a little bit. Okay, any last questions? Yes. Could you please elaborate on the feature engineering, how that feature is being generated? Uh, what kind of techniques do you use? And, uh, yeah, basically there's a roll of a dice mm -hmm. and we figure out from that roll of the dice which features to select, the raw features. Okay. And then once those are selected, we can use something like truncated SVD to choose which are the optimal features. And then we score that with a tree and we say, well, okay, we got a score and we also got out of the GBM get a variable importance. Mm -hmm. And from that variable importance, we'll then choose the top three as the features. So it's a cycle of uh, generating features, random selecting what uh, features to generate, uh, scoring them, and out of the residual features that come up, using those as your actual features. Is it always three uh, top or? It's randomly it chosen. No, no, yeah. it could be any criteria to choose the top, top features from the GDM. Uh, it, it's based upon a specific way of calculating variable importance, if that's what you mean. Mm -hmm. It's looking at the tree and figuring out uh, from the splits yes. which ones were the most important yeah, variables. Part, yeah. But okay. how do you choose that? You say that just top three. You choose oh, top three. yeah. Say there's it's a. Always top three. Or? We're we're always developing this, but say that there say it's the top five, and among that you might randomly choose one or two or three or four or five of those. Okay, but what if there? Are they are on the top, but what if they are not important? Like you can, you can insert a random variable, and random variable could also be in the top 
sometimes if this model is not relevant? Well, let's talk about it afterwards, yeah. I'm not quite sure. I think that's good. Yeah. All right, thanks for everybody for coming. Really appreciate it. Uh, feel free to come up and ask me questions. I'll be around for a little while.